Sing it. <laughs> okay, can you hear me, Zoom world? Yeah. Yay! <laughs> so what I wanted to say is that I'm watching what's happening in the county right now. And I'm watching the people that helped save us during COVID being forced to leave in droves. I'm watching people who look like me being forced to leave, including one of those people, my son who is 26 years old, has autism, lives on social security and had to find a place to live in Santa Clara County, which is too far away for his mommy. And I'm watching what's happening to the people that we're asking to hold up the next generation of leaders, our childcare workers and our educators being forced to leave the profession, being forced to leave the profession because we can't give them a roof. We can do better. And I know that everyone in here and on Zoom is committed to doing better. And I'm asking us all to stay the course. If you need a voice to, or something to lean on, call me up. If you want cookies, I will bake them for you. But this work is vital and important. And I'm so grateful and thankful for all of you here in the room today. And with that. Okay, I'm gonna reintroduce myself. My name is Kalima Salahuddin, and I'm the vice chair of the Housing Leadership Council, and I'm on the board of the Jefferson Union High School District. And I am thrilled, yes, I am super thrilled to be introducing our 2022 keynote speaker, Superintendent Gina Sudaria. A bit about this amazing woman that you're about to meet. She was appointed as interim superintendent for the Ravenswood City School District on March 28, 2019. Note that date, 2019. And then she became the permanent superintendent in July, 2020. She wanted to stay after that. What was one of the most horrific things that ever happened to public education, she stayed. That's who we want to live here. Ms. Sudaria has been with the Reverend City School District for 24 years. Gina promises to diligently ensure that the district moves forward while remaining student-centered with, with the recognition that it exists for the children and their success. In collaboration with the Board of Trustees and the Ravenwood staff, she will carry out the district's mission and strategic priorities, ensuring that decisions and actions made dismantle racism and social injustice in our schools. I give you Gina. Good afternoon, so pleased to be here. <laughs> I am Gina Sudaria and I'm the proud superintendent of the Ravenswood City School District. But now I think I need to become a member of the Housing Leadership Council for sure. <laughs> what have I been missing? Um, I'm gonna go off script too, just a little bit here. Um, I feel very empowered and motivated to continue to fight for housing for all staff and individuals who need affordable housing to remain in their community that they've grown, grown up in. And I'm really encouraged by the elected officials. I'm encouraged by the staff, board members of the Housing Leadership Council. And I just wanna thank you because I know there's challenging decisions that need to be had. And it impacts not only you professionally, but personally, because this is a personal matter. I also just wanna thank our CBO, Ravenswood, Will Eager who has done his due diligence to learn about real estate and commercial real We didn't go into education for this. Quick story. You might know a woman by the name of Bree Newsom. She climbed up a flagpole in front of a government building to pull down the Confederate flag. She co-conspired with a white man so that they can pull this off. It wasn't just a spur of the moment thing. They planned this, got her bail, taught her how to climb the pole. 
there's an aftermath, there's consequences to resist. When they were trying to figure out how she climbed up, how she was gonna get down, get, the, her, get her down from the pole, one of the police officers was going to tase the pole. James Tyson, the white co-conspirator, white male, put his hand on the pole. Will is my James Tyson. And I, sin I sincerely mean that. And I know you're truly embarrassed. <laughs> I did not intend to do that. But there's many of you in here who are doing the work. I didn't go into education to do this work. Here's a case study specifically of how housing is impacting Ravenswood. Last week, an administrative assistant one of our, at a, one of our elementary schools asked me for a letter of recommendation. My heart sank because if you know schools, you would be familiar that administrative assistants are like a critical player. They know every child's name. They know the needs of each family. They have the bell schedule memorized and they literally handhold the principal throughout the day. I know, I was a principal. <laughs> My administrative assistant ruled the school. So running through all the vital things that they do during the day, I was like, but, but why? And then I remembered, she commutes from Patterson with her husband, leaving their home at, eight, at 4.30 in the morning to arrive into town so they could make sure that they are present and on time at eight o'clock. Liz was raised in East Palo Alto since she was a baby. She attended Ravenswood schools, sent all of her children to the four schools. She even lived, lived close enough to walk to work. She witnessed her parents having the ability to earn the means to purchase their own home in East Palo Alto without hesitation. She decided to move her family with her parents so that they could save the home when her father became ill. Her parents decided to purchase a home in Merced because if you were to sell the home there here in East Palo Alto, you can pay outright a home in Merced so that they can retire in peace. Well, then Liz needed to decide, do I stay in my community or do I move out to Merced? She decided to stay. And with that, she learned it became nearly impossible to find affordable housing. But she made it possible by living in a one bedroom apartment with her husband, four children, and a sibling in a $3,200 a month that cost $3,200 a month. She did this for several years and it became unbearable, of course. So a four bedroom, three and a half bath for $2,600 a month seemed very attractive, right? Despite the 90 to two hour commute every single day. I'm writing her letter of recommendation this afternoon. What we're seeing in Ravenswood and across the state is a culmination of two interconnected challenges, a longstanding and deepening housing crisis and an ever worsening education workforce shortage. The state estimates that California needs to build two and a half million homes by 2030, and of that, one million need to be affordable. That would require about 500,000 new housing units annually. But last year in 2021, local governments issued permits for only about 120,000 units. At the same time, home ownership costs and rent prices have grown out of reach for many far outpacing wage growth. In the last decade, rental prices in East Palo Alto alone have increased by 65.7%, while home ownership prices grew by 160%. Just to connect it back to Ravenswood, because that's where my home is and my passion, the average salary across all of our staff members is around $86,000. A number of our district a number our district has worked hard to increase. We are investing in our employees. We have increased their salaries so that they're now at the top third percent across, this, across the county. But the average home value in East Palo Alto is just shy of a million dollars. It's not feasible to live here. I don't even live in my community that I love so much. I'm in the East Bay. 
So what does that mean for our staff? Our teachers can't afford to send their kids to our district. Our kitchen staff don't run into families at the grocery store. Our bus drivers are driving home every day to Stockton. And I write letters of recommendations. Moreover, we are not all experiencing this problem equally as we've all learned um, today during our workshops. These dual crises further exacerbate existing inequities across racial and socioeconomic divides. Research has found that public educators experiencing rent burdens are disproportionately likely to be people of color. And in East Palo Alto specifically, the poverty rate for households of people of color is nearly twice that of white householders. Our district's own land, including the former flood site we are now trying to develop into affordable housing has borne witness to the dark history of housing policy in this region. Throughout the mid 1900s, redlining restricted who could gain access to loans. And in Menlo Park and other white suburbs in the Bay Area, people of color were explicitly banned from buying homes due to racial covenants by law. Ballot measures like Measure V in Menlo Park that restrict zoning for affordable housing continue the same cycle we have seen throughout history. Putting the highest densities and most affordable units in areas that are predominantly lower income, marginalized and communities of color. We know housing is a human right. And thanks to the pandemic, we understand better that ever than ever that housing is a physical and mental health issue. But the housing crisis is also a crisis of education and opportunity. Housing affordability and availability is a key driver of staff turnover, both for people like Liz in Ravenswood and across the state and county, country. This turnover directly impacts the quality of education our students receive. Less consistency limits the collaboration between staff and relationship building with students that is critical for instructional improvement. Liz knows families. Our principal relies on Liz calling families, making sure they're okay, calling about students who are sick. When we can hold on to our staff, we build stronger communities. And the investment that Ravenswood puts into staff to then go and live somewhere else to make more money, family, our staff don't want to leave, but they also want to establish a livelihood. And as a result, student achievement, let alone the relationships that are lost, never increase. Beyond forcing teachers and staff to leave their communities, the lack of affordable housing also makes it difficult for districts like ours to attract new high quality educators for our schools. We've learned we cannot talk about prioritizing education for our kids without talking about affordable housing. As I mentioned earlier, I am a career educator, but I have honestly, I have always been deeply involved and I, I'm learning now how I can be a housing advocate. When I used to think about housing, it was because of the high cost of living, driving our teachers away, or it was because students were just unhoused. I had this sense that the rising cost of housing was due to the broader economic factors outside of our control. But the development we are trying to build at the former flood site has opened up my eyes to the systemic barriers that have been erected to making housing difficult. This is a site in a prime neighborhood that has been sitting in Menlo Park for over a decade, just an empty lot in a neighborhood surrounded by multi-million dollar homes. You know, I, I didn't realize this was gonna be such a challenge. And when there's arguments like there's air pollution because the property is next to a freeway and you have million dollar homes next to the same freeway breathing the same air. 
and there's no amenities close by. Our staff and teachers commute 90 to two hours of work to work every day. They can get themselves to their work a mile and a half away. They can get to a grocery store. So there are too many voices missing from the process. Who is advocating for the people who would live in this development? For our project, we sought to, to highlight the teachers, staff, and families who would benefit. Too often their voices are missing. This gravity of this, the gravity of this crisis cannot be understated, but neither can the opportunity for us to act. And so I challenge all of us today to one, elevate the voices of those who have historically had their voices taken from them. Time and again, housing has been weaponized against marginalized groups in our own neighborhoods, from discriminatory loan programs to redlining and blockbusting. Our community members are still living in the aftermath of decades of exclusionary practice, policies and practices. It is on all of us to amplify and advocate for their voices. Two, don't just come out to say no. Come out to say yes and support projects. Closing equity gaps requires those of us with privilege to sacrifice something. That means advocating for projects near your house, not just coming out against things. Think not just about how something does or doesn't benefit you, but rather about what housing means to someone who now has a home. And three, cultivate partnerships across sectors, which I'm feeling it here. <laughs> from educators and housing professionals to policymakers and advocacy, group, advocacy groups to the community members who live in our neighborhoods. As a district, we haven't always been active in advocating for housing in the past. You know, Pastor Baines, I, I, I know you came to me too about housing and I couldn't make the connection initially. It is clear as day. It is not a separate issue but it has never been more clear that housing permeates everything we do. And now we're working hard to rethink the strategy behind our district's plan, something we can all do. This is an all of us problem. It will take all of us to solve it. In closing, East Palo Alto, the place so many of our students and staff call home, we are no strangers to the effects of the housing crisis in our community. So much so that in his book, Golden Gates, Connor Doctry de dedicates an entire chapter to the history of housing in our neighborhoods, dating back to the mid 1900s. But we are also no strangers to the work of resistance and advocacy and fighting against this crisis. And throughout that history, one saying has risen as a common refrain. No hay peor lucha que la que no se hace. There is no worse fight than the one that isn't fought. I'm, I wish I said it, but I didn't. <laughs> that was a community member from East Palo Alto. I'm fighting for Liz and over 100 teachers and staff who feel forced to consider leaving our district because of housing. I'm fighting for the 1,500 plus students in Ravenswood schools who deserve every bit as good of an education as their Bay Area peers, regardless of the zip code they live in. And I hope I'll be fighting alongside each and every one of you because the crisis and the solutions needed to solve it belong to all of us. Thank you. You are amazing. Thank you so much. This year, we are very excited and honored to present the Housing Leader Award to Seema Patel. Oh. 
oh, okay. I was like, I know she's here because I remember checking her in this morning. <laughs> the Housing Leader Award honors very special San Mateo County housers who have committed their work to push forward our affordable housing movement and racial equity. Seema Patel leads the guest and digital experience team in Google's real estate organization, which uses exper wait, experiential design to create immersive physical spaces that inspire and delight. She currently serves on San Mateo County's Planning Commission, General Plan Subcommittee, and Civic Arts Committee, and has previously served on Yimby's Action. Just ignore what's happening. To the <laughs> and has previously served on Yimby Action's Regional Advisory Board. Seema has been an active volunteer on the No on Why campaign, and also volunteers for the Campaign for Fair Housing Elements as a housing element watchdog. In her spare time, she has two young kids that were born in San Mateo and is a passion and is passionate about making our region an equitable place where everyone and anyone can live and thrive. Please welcome me as I please welcome and congratulate with me Seema on receiving the Housing Leader Award this year. Wow, um, I was shocked two weeks ago when I got the email from Vivian, I'm still shocked. Um, so first, I just wanna thank the Housing Leadership Council for all of the work you do to inform and educate and advocate for housing in our community. I got involved in housing advocacy because of the HLC. It was only two years ago that Leora messaged me on Nextdoor and said, hey, you've been posting some good takes on housing would you maybe want to join the HLC and volunteer? And I said, sure. And that was how I fell down the rabbit hole of housing advocacy. Um, we all who work in housing advocacy have that moment that we realize we have to do something. And for me, that was a year after I moved to the Bay Area to San Mateo and put an offer on a house. And it was at the time the cheapest house that was listed for sale in San Mateo in our most affordable neighborhood. It had two cracks in the foundation, a gutted kitchen, the garage roof was collapsed into the garage and the lot backed up to Caltrain. And I thought, surely we'll have a chance at this one. And um, we offered 50 over asking. And of course we were outbid. And then our, our agent told us, you were outbid by a cash offer. And I turned to my husband and I said, we're a dual income tech couple and we don't have kids and we can't afford to buy this broken down house. How do teachers live here? How do firefighters live here? How do any public servants live here? And that's when I started to look into it and realized they can't. Um, six years later, I was walking downtown with my daughter and the construction fencing for Kiku Crossing had just gone up and there was a big banner on the fencing. And my daughter stopped to look at the sign that had all the organizations that worked together to make that possible, including all the organizations who financed it. And she asked me, what is this? And I said, ooh, I can tell you all about this. Um, this, this is an apartment building that's gonna have 225 new homes. And what makes it so special is that these homes are gonna cost a lot less money than the homes in our neighborhood. We live in that neighborhood. And I explained to her, um, the homes in our neighborhood are cost the most money of many of the homes in the Bay Area, which cost the most money of many of the homes in California, which cost the most money of many of the homes in the United States very, very few people can afford to live in this neighborhood. And she paused for a second and said, well, I guess when I move, grow up, I'll move away. And it just floored me that our children are growing up thinking, I'm not gonna live here when I get old. This place that I was born and raised, I just, I'm just gonna move somewhere else. Um, and so that's why I'm super passionate about making sure we have enough housing for the people who wanna live here, but also making sure we have enough housing for our children and our grandchildren to stay here as well. 
Um, I'm also really passionate about breaking down systemic and entrenched racism. I think a lot of people say, oh, we passed the Fair Housing Act in 1968, no more racial covenants, problem solved. Um, and I think we all know there's a lot more work to be done to affirmatively further fair housing and, and break down intense patterns of segregation. Um, and I think that starts with looking at where we put our affordable housing. We can't continue to concentrate it in former industrial zones or around our highways. We need to integrate it within our broader communities. There is a fantastic piece that John Oliver did a couple weeks ago on environmental justice and housing that talks about um, all of the uh, detrimental effects of doing that to our disadvantaged communities that I highly recommend watching and sharing as a primer to your friends for why this issue is so important. Um, I also want to recognize the other nominees on this list. I'm so honored to receive this award, but I'm also incredibly humbled to be even on the same list as the other people who are considered. So many of them are people who have educated me and mentored me over the past few years. Um, and, and it just goes to speak to how we all need to work together to solve our housing crisis. We got into this situation, I think, because our cities acted somewhat independently and didn't really look to see what our neighbors were doing as we continued to build office or continued to block housing. And we all need to work together to solve it. A um, few months into being a planning commissioner, I got our site inventory and methodology for our housing element. And I opened it up and I thought, I have no idea what I'm looking at right now. I have no idea how to evaluate this. And I reached out to the Campaign for Fair Housing Elements and said, could someone walk me through this and help me even understand what I'm looking at? And it was um, countless hours that these volunteers spent answering literally hundreds of questions I had over six months to educate me on how this works. Um, other folks who've been super helpful um, uh, are, for our general plan, I, I suggested some specific actions that San Mateo could take to ensure that we maintain a jobs housing balance. That would not have been possible if people like um, Mayor Giselle Hale and Mayor Lucas Ramirez didn't take the time to sit down with me and say, let me explain to you how we did this in Redwood City. Let me explain to you how we did this in Mountain View. Um, and so it's really by, I think, working together that we're going to be able to share ideas and share solutions to this problem. Um, and so, I, again, I just want to say thank you all so much. Um, and I'm really looking forward to continuing to work with everyone in this room to making sure we have a region where everybody and everyone can live and thrive. Thank you. Thank you so much, Seema. It means so much to me that you are doing this work for all of our kids. Um, because no child should grow up with the mindset that I can't afford to live here when I become of age. That's not a society that I wanna be a part of. So thank you for your work. So we are now giving you time to enjoy the rest of your lunch and their afternoon workshops will begin at 1.15. The Affordable Housing 101, Perspectives from the Housing Ecosystem, you stay here. Reentrification, Reimagining Housing Through Arts is in the Sequoia Room, and Innovations in Extremely Low Income Housing is in the Redwood Room. And we like to remind you to join us all at 3.30 for our Hauser Happy Hour. Oh, that's cute. At um, <laughs> Alhambra Irish Pub. Look for an HLC board member. Um, if you're interested in attending and space is limited, but you know, we're housers, we'll get you all in there. <laughs> Thank you.